My first guest tonight is uh, rather a phenomenon on the political scene as a, a citizen politician making his first try for public office. He was elected California's 33rd governor in 1966 by a majority of something around over a million votes. And he held that office, you know, for eight years. And he used to joke that in his earlier profession, he used to write off in the sunset with the words, the end on his back. But there are those who would say that Ronald Reagan, uh, 1975, may only be the beginning. Would you welcome, please, the former governor of California, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to be here, John. And nice of you to have me here after Oh, a little more than two months unemployment. That's right. Uh, how does it feel to be, uh, well, you're not really unemployed now because I know you're doing a syndicated column and um, for many news, around 120 papers, I think, and a radio show and uh, on the lecture tour. But how does it feel to be, I don't know whether you use the word temporarily out of politics or not, but we'll get into that later. Uh, how does it feel to be away from Sacramento? Well, it's uh, doing what I'm doing. I've wanted to for a long time. It's very exciting. And um, uh, there's mixed emotions when you step down. There's always things that you had left undone that you'd like to have done, but then uh, all of a sudden the curtain's pulled and that chapter's over and... Uh, Somebody else takes over? Yeah. What's, uh, did you have any major disappointments? What would you have uh, liked to have done or your biggest disappointment, maybe your biggest highlight in office as you look back on it? Well, uh, I'll start with the biggest highlight. The uh, First of all was proving that some things I'd long believed as a citizen would work, that you could introduce common sense in government and after the first traumatic shock, uh, you kind of made some of it work. We, um, we came into quite a, a mess, and at the end of eight years, uh, you know, government in the United States, federal, state, and local, has been growing for 20 years in size about two and a half times as fast as the increase in population, except for the last eight years in California. We turned over a government that was the same size as the one we inherited eight years ago. There had been no growth. And uh, in some departments, this meant an increase of as much as 66% in the workload. Mm -hmm. But um, part of that was the welfare reforms. Right. Uh, welfare was increasing here in California, 40,000 cases a month. And uh, we left with about 400,000 fewer people on welfare than there were four years ago. This saved the taxpayers about a billion dollars. But what was equally important? We were spread so thin we couldn't do what we should have done for uh, the really needy, the really deserving. Right. And we were able to increase their grants by way of those reforms 43%. Right. Now, you asked for what was the greatest disappointment. Uh, the people handed it to us when I think they were deceived, but when they voted down the tax limitation plan. I still say that the answer to our problems in this country, even at the national level, is to have a law that says there is a percentage limit of the people's earnings that government cannot go beyond without the consent of the people. Yeah. You're, talking about, uh, you're talking about the gross income of the country and how much they can appropriate for, uh, That's right. for federal projects. See, when, uh, when you and I were boys back in the Midwest, right. governments, federal, state, and local, were only taking about 15 cents out of every dollar earned. Today, they're taking almost half of every dollar earned in the United States. And most people don't realize it because the taxes are hidden in the so-called business taxes. You know, the politician that stands up and yells, oh, let's save the little man, let's tax business, and everybody mm -hmm. yells, hooray. But they haven't figured out that every tax on business is just a part of the cost of production. And the customer winds up paying it when he buys the product. It's a hidden sales tax. There's 116 of them in our the suit of clothes that each one of us is, is that wearing. Right? Suppose a lot of uh, economists have suggested, and I don't know that it'll ever come to be in this country, that they're, if they closed all of the loopholes and uh, corporations and maybe tax loopholes and even on the rich certain loopholes and, and made a percentage income and made a flat fee without all of the deductions, that the government might raise as much money as they do now. Oh, sure. And really, the loopholes, this has been overdone by the politicians, too. No. The bulk of the money that is taken by what are called loopholes are the legitimate deductions with which if the people didn't have them, they couldn't pay their income tax. Interest on their mortgage, right. uh, interest on the installments on their, on their car, their property taxes on their home if they have one and right. so forth. These are, in politicians' eyes, loopholes. But 
we ought to have tax reform, and we ought to start by making it so simple that you don't have to hire a lawyer to find out how much you owe every year. That's for sure. It used to be, uh, it used to be a little simplified, but not anymore. We, we, Johnny, we live in the only country in the world where it takes more brains to figure out your income tax than it does to earn the income. <laughs> you might be right. Why, why do you think people are so, they seem to be so disheartened now. I, I know, the, let's not get into the Watergate thing, but that certainly had something to do with the, uh, the antipathy, I think, of a lot of people toward government. Now we, we see these revelations, or whether they're revelations or at least accusations that possibly the CIA has been involved in some operations that they shouldn't have been involved in, certainly domestically. And people regularly get turned off. How do you, how do you turn people around and say, all right, now, we're not going to do this anymore. And every day you see more of these things, and I think people withdraw further and further. And, and that's too bad. I know, and I think that part of it is because we're being bludgeoned every day. It's news. Bad things are news. Uh, we just, uh, every day we pick up and they read a, record another tenth of a percent unemployment and so forth. Uh, we keep hearing the, the bad things. We hear the accusations, and we're kind of used to accepting the accusation as proof of guilt. Uh, now, I'm on the CIA commission, so I'm rather limited. I cannot talk at no, this stage. That's true. But I think one of the sad things is that the American people cannot know instead, frankly, we have to have a counterintelligence organization for our own safety. If the American people knew the extent to which we're being spied on by the Russians, uh, they'd throw detente out the window and Brezhnev and a few fellows with it. Well, obviously, uh, I agree that that has to go on internationally to protect your national security, but when they start looking at you know, their, their own congressmen and own private citizens whose, whose only uh, threat to national security seem to be to voice some difference of opinions, that's going a little over the well, line, isn't it? No, uh, because, well, again, as I say, we... Oh, you're right, that's right. You we, can't can't, uh, we can't give any progress reports. You want to speak into the ashtray here and tell me privately? Uh, all I'd say to the people is, wait until the report comes in. And I think when a report comes in, uh, um, uh, maybe they might be greatly reassured. Yeah. I didn't mean to put you behind the eight ball there. I realize, of course, you're on that commission and you couldn't expand on that. Let's take a brief break and we'll, we'll come right back and get on another subject. <laughs> we're talking with uh, former Governor Reagan and uh, during the break we were discussing. When I mentioned uh, that I thought most people uh, were not apathetic, I think they're confused, basically, because you hear intelligent people from uh, both political parties are in the middle, conservatives and liberals, and they all seem to have different answers as to what is going wrong in the country. Some people say, well, let's let the government spend billions of dollars, and then some other people say, no, no more federal spending. Uh, let's give the tax rebates. And the other intelligent people say, no tax rebates. We've got to do this and do yeah. that. So everybody is confused. Uh, how, how do you see the thing? What, how are we going to get out of this? Well, uh, Johnny, I think that one of the things is that people keep looking to government for the answer, and government's the problem. Yeah. You, a moment ago, you, you asked, you know, about people and feeling not only confused, but right. low and, and down in America. First of all, the American people, if they would just take a little inventory and look around, you triple our troubles, and we're better off than any other people on Earth. And we've asked so much of government, and we've gotten in the habit over the last 40 years of thinking that government has the answers. There's very little that government can do as efficiently and as economically as the people can do themselves. And if government would shut the doors and sneak away for about three weeks, we'd never miss them. Now, the... If, if the people Anybody wanted to... Anybody you had in mind particularly? Huh? <laughs> no, I said this while I was in government. <laughs> okay. Our biggest problem is that we have built a permanent structure of government, federal, state, and local the permanent employees, and they've come to the place that they actually determine policy in this country more than does the Congress of the United States. Mm -hmm. There are 14 and a half million public employees in the United States. That's quite a voting block. And the bureaus and agencies, not in Washington, I heard you talking earlier about uh, some of the research programs. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a senator the other day, and he took up some pages of the congressional record. He was doing the same thing you were, listing all these crazy research programs, and how much they were costing, and wound up his speech by introducing his own. He wants a study and a research of transcendental meditation. So, uh, you know, there's a state senator in Michigan, and he just found out the other day they got a $93,000 study on whether chitlins are bad for you. And, and 
He said that as a fourth generation chitlin eater, he figured that he could tell you how for 93 cents you could find out the answer to that. You no, know, we laugh at those things, yeah. but they do happen, I guess. Oh, know. listen, there, you, you had some beauties and there's some others. What would you say if I told you about one, a study in which this was called the, um, the uh, demography of happiness? And in this study, the government found out that uh, young people are happier than old people. <laughs> And uh, they found out that people that earn more are happier than people that earn less. And they found out that well people are happier than six people. That's good. Well, that's now, I'm glad this to was two hundred and forty-nine thousand dollars to find out it's better to be rich, young, and healthy than old, poor, and sick. <laughs> so when you say now that it's that the government may be the problem, so. Uh, so what do people do? They well, have to look to somebody, and you say if they look for themselves, that's uh, it may be good advice. But how about somebody home. who's on a you know a social security pension or a pension that are trying to live on one hundred and fifty dollars a month? You know they have to look to somebody, I guess. Yeah. And they're saying, hey, we can't make it. We can't afford to go to a doctor. Uh, well, sixty-two percent of the people can't stay home in an election and cure things as we did in the last election. I just read this uh, week on I heard this week on the radio. They dropped three hundred thousand voters from the Los Angeles roll because they didn't take the time to go to the polls in the last election. Three hundred thousand people. That's the lowest percentage in history. Only thirty-eight percent of the people voted in the national election. And this means that people aren't paying any attention to what. Well, here a poll was taken recently that found out that only 46% of the people in the poll could name their United States congressman. But what was worse, 86% of those who could name him couldn't tell you a single thing that he represented or stood for. They just knew that he represented the yeah, state. But he was a congressman, but what's he doing while he's up there? And the same is true at the, at the local levels of government and, and all the rest. But um, So you're saying people really have to take an active interest, and you have to have uh, citizen action right. groups locally and... Uh, and let them know. Concerned See, the special citizens interest and groups... Now, the special interest groups aren't, as everyone thought, big, powerful business interests or something that are going to persuade government to do things. As a matter of fact, I don't know anyone with less influence today in government than business. They're just a convenient whipping boy. But it's the groups that have got a particular ax to grind. You can't have a power plant because it might interfere with the, the seagulls. Now, I think I'm an environmentalist. And I do not agree with those people way over on the edge who paved the whole country over in the name of progress. But also, I don't like those on the other extreme that won't let you build a house unless it looks like a bird's nest. Someplace in the middle, we got to allow people or ecology, too. Right. Well, this kind of group, and they want their particular program. Hundreds of dollars have been added to the cost of an automobile putting gadgets on it to, to clear up the air. We're the only country in the world that's set out to do it that way. The automobile industry, over and over again, told government if they give them more time, the right. answer lay in making the motor more efficient and making it burn the fuel better. And uh, when they were given the limited time, there was only one thing they could turn to. That was the add-ons that you had to go. And uh, the verdict is really kind of still out on, on those, whether they're, they're going to add more sulfuric done. acid yeah. to, the, to the air or not. Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? Now, you've been asked this question. I'm sure you knew that I was, would, might possibly bring it up tonight. Uh, there's an election coming up. You're, uh, you're out of politics now, but you're, you're speaking, and as I say, you're going around the country. Um, do you envision a possibility, uh, say, in 76, if the convention, say, was deadlocked? I'm giving you all the theories and so forth, and the conservatives took over, possibly, and got control of the, uh, of the electoral process, and they couldn't quite make a decision, and they came to you and said, uh, Governor Reagan, uh, we can't decide between Mr. Uh, Ford and Mr. Rockefeller. We're divided. Um, would, you like to, uh, would you like to go to the White House? Uh, you remember that answer I gave you about the CIA? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, come on. No, I won't buy it. I'm not going to buy it. No, I, I can understand the CIA now, but... Uh, no, I... I just, thought that was delicately phrased. I, yes. <laughs> verbose but delicate. Yeah, verbose but delicate. <laughs> I... Uh, no, I think it's an unanswerable question. I don't think anyone, in view of the things that have gone on the last few years, knows what's going to happen in the, in the next two years mm -hmm. down the road. I think that everyone should hope and pray that people are there will do the job so well that there won't be any question mm -hmm. about it. Because if they do, then everything's all right with the rest of us. Mm -hmm. uh, you think they're doing their job well? Well, I agree with some things and disagree with others. 
when they when they give me a when they give me a choice between a 53 billion dollar deficit in the budget and an 80 billion dollar deficit when budget deficits are what's causing inflation i don't see that there's any room to be on either side of that argument yeah i think the that. answer to curing inflation is a balanced budget now how do you do that i mean well, it's not, how do you balance the budget well, balancing the budget is like protecting. You don't your spend more than you take in, right? Yeah, it's like protecting your virtue. You have to learn to say no. <laughs> There's got to be another way. <laughs> <laughs> what, no. What's the second option? <laughs> Well, no, there are some ways that this could be brought about. First of all, that limitation. Here, here's another one. Why shouldn't we have, in addition to a simplified income tax, why shouldn't we also have a law that says that any time a legislator or a congressman introduces a spending program, he has to introduce with it a tax program to pay for it? Then let the people find out. There was a woman that, uh, from a financial firm that was back at the President's Economic Council, and her words weren't quoted. Everybody else's words got in the paper, all the... Hellers and the Galbraths and all the so-called right. economists. And I, had a, I have a degree in economics, so I can say this. I think an economist is someone who has a Phi Beta Kappa key on one end of his watch chain and no watch on the other. Uh, this woman said that you go to the polls and you ask the people, do they want some social service, some program that government can give? And the people in the polls are apt to read and say, hey, that sounds good, yeah. Mm -hmm. But she says that isn't exactly accurate. She says, put a $100 bill in each person's hand. And then show them the program and say, now, isn't that a nice program? Do you want it? Give me the $100. And she says, see what the poll says then, and how many people hang on to the $100 instead of the program. In other words, if it's rather hidden and someone doesn't know exactly yeah. where it's going to come they from. They all it's... start, all the government programs start a dollar down, and we'll catch you later. And, uh, and they, they multiply all of those yeah. things that you were. The Office of Management and Budget in Washington that's responsible for the budget, putting mm -hmm. up, putting the budget together, cannot even tell you how many boards, commissions, agencies, bureaus, and departments there are in the federal government. Yeah. But all of them can pass regulations. And those regulations have the force of law. And the difference is, when you break the law, you're innocent until proven guilty. When you break a regulation, the fellow that charges you with breaking the regulation, you're guilty. Right. And if you want to take him to court and prove you're innocent, that's up to you. Right. And uh, all of these are things that, that um, yes, we can trim the budget. There's nope. enough fat in the federal government that if you rendered it, you could wash the world. You, uh, <laughs> now you took, it's, they took a poll of the American people the past week, and I think 78% or something, around 75% were opposed to more military aid to uh, Vietnam and Cambodia and Southeast Asia in general. And yet the administration uh, was, trying to tell the American people that a couple hundred million or $222 million would make some kind of difference or that the government might make it. And uh, how, how do you feel? Do you think that that is a, a lost cause in a way? I think people can see humanitarian, uh, you know, for children, hospitals, et cetera, medical supplies and food. But it seems that the public has just almost had it up with military involvement where we feel we are not directly threatened. Well, we, we are uh, fed up. We're war weary after a long and badly fought war. On the other hand, and this is one where I'll probably lose a lot of people because it isn't popular or political to say this uh, today. Uh, when we withdrew our troops, we made a ceasefire, a peace agreement. And it was based on uh, su supporting the non-communist forces in Indochina on a basis of one for one replacement. Every bullet they expended a bullet to replace it. If the communists violated the ceasefire, mm -hmm. The communists have violated the ceasefire 72,000 times since it was instituted and we brought our men home. And I think for the United States to break its word, we're in that agreement. We pledged something. And the Congress is now saying that the United States reserves the right to just break its word and not, what other allies ever going to trust us? And I, uh, there's no question that backed by Red China and the Soviet Union, the communist forces in Vietnam and Cambodia are on their way to take those over. They do, of course, Laos just automatically falls. Mm -hmm. Then they're on the edge of Indonesia, 140 million people, which comes within 14 miles at its nearest point of the Philippines. The domino theory is 
in is that existence. still a viable theory, do you think? And uh, yes, it is. And I, I could see the United States one day being very, very lonely. Now, it's a very funny thing that the same forces that want to cut our defense spending are the same ones that want to increase all these social services and this social tinkering and experimenting that hasn't worked. And every time it doesn't work, they just impose a more expensive <coughs> program on top of it. I think the American people, if they really look at all the facts, uh, yes, we want fiscal responsibility. But I think we also want a country that is strong enough at all times that we can say to any adventurous guys over there on the other side of the water, you better look twice, brother, mm -hmm. uh, before you start getting rough, yeah. that we can take care of ourselves. As you said, as you said, you, even before you made the statement, that would probably get mixed re uh, yeah. uh, reaction from the audience. And I can understand that. People are, and it's hard to understand how maybe your interest is involved 10,000 miles away. Uh, but Russia seems concerned that their interests mm -hmm. extend all the way to Cuba and to South America, to Chile and to other countries of that kind. And they're the ones that have said they're going to impose their way of life on the rest of the world. We mm -hmm. haven't said we want to do it to the rest of the world, our way. Let me ask you one more question uh, before you go. Let us assume that there's a third party that, that neither party seems to go. Yeah. Uh, you like this approach already, huh? <laughs> uh, and they're thrown into disarray, as they say. And a third party is formed. Would you think that'll ever happen in this country, where a third party will be a, a major type of uh, uh, well, alternate I, to uh, what we have? Well, I'd still prefer to see uh, a revitalization of the two major parties we have, uh, because the two-party system has served us very well. Third parties have a notorious way of not being successful. Now, the Republican Party, some people say, well, that was a third party 100 years ago when it started. It actually wasn't. It was a second party. The Whig Party had shrunk and shrunk. And then the remainder of the Whig Party said to two other groups that had formed parties, hey, want to get together with us? And they changed their name and called themselves the other party. And so it was, in effect, the Whigs just disappeared. It was a new second party. Right. Uh, maybe this is time. Maybe it's time for uh, realignment between people who might be finding themselves in the wrong parties. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are some people still voting. I was a Democrat most of my life. I became a Republican only not too many years ago. And uh, I had the pleasure of telling some of those people that are saying the Republican Party ought to broaden its base the other day that uh, when I switched parties, I didn't do it because the two parties were alike. I did it because they were different. Right. And um, I think that the two parties ought to stand up as to what they represent, what they stand for. A third party, I, they have a way of electing the wrong people they, because they simply divide themselves from the other forces that feel the same way, and then the other fella sneaks in. Right. And um, I'd, uh, it, it could happen that, the, that neither party would, would rec represent what the people want, and right. finally the people would take some action and do something about it. But, I'd, I'd rather devote our effort to seeing if we can't find out what the present two parties stand for and which one we want but to But you don't to. see yourself, or do you see yourself as maybe as a part of that actively, active politically again? Uh, I certainly well, don't give up, do I? Uh, yeah, you, you, uh, you sure, sure don't. I wish I could think of a good get-off line. I have Lawrence Pivak's old question, yeah. you know, for this. Nancy, Nancy, you know, said to, to say hello tonight. She thought it was great that we we're both in town at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you too, huh? I get that. Thanks for being with us tonight, really. It was a pleasure to pleasure. see you again, my best friend.